Hello, I'm Steve Siegelbaum of the Department of Neuroscience and Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Columbia University. Our lab is interested in understanding how the hippocampus processes electrical signals to encode spatial memories. Most studies on the hippocampus have focused on the classic trisynaptic pathway, one of the most intensely studied set of synapses in the brain. In the trisynaptic circuit, input to the hippocampus comes from layer two neurons of the entorhinal cortex. These neurons excite dentate gyrus granule cells, and the dentate gyrus granule cells then excite CA3 pyramidal neurons. The CA3 neurons, in turn, send their axons to activate the CA1 pyramidal neurons. CA1 neurons then send their axons back to the entorhinal cortex, completing the cortico-hippocampal loop. We were recently prompted to re-explore the hippocampal circuit based on some surprising results from the Moser and Tanagawa labs. These groups found that physical or genetic lesions of the CA3 inputs to CA1 have surprisingly little effect on CA1 neuron firing in vivo or on spatial memory storage. This residual function was proposed to result from a second set of inputs to hippocampus that arise from layer 3 entorhinal cortex neurons and terminate on the very distal dendrites of CA1 neurons. Although these direct inputs are preserved by the lesions, they produce only a weak depolarization of the CA1 soma and so are very inefficient in driving hippocampal output. Hello, I'm Didier Chevalier, a postdoc in Steve's lab. In this study, we have focused on the CA2 area of the hippocampus, a relatively small region of neurons lying between CA1 and CA3. Although CA2 was first described as a separate area of the hippocampus more than 75 years ago by Laurent Tedeno, its role in the hippocampal circuit is largely unknown. Because anatomical evidence suggests that CA2 neurons receive direct input from the entorhinal cortex, we wonder whether the cortical inputs can drive CA2 neurons, which in turn might drive the firing of CA1 neurons in a disynaptic loop. Indeed, we found that stimulation of layer 3 axon produced a surprisingly large EPSP in the CA2 neuron soma that was fivefold larger than the EPSP produced by layer 3 inputs in CA1 neurons. In addition, CA2 neurons receive strong convergent inputs from both layer 3 and layer 2 axons. As a result, combined activation of layer 2 and 3 inputs produced a very large EPSP in the CA2 neurons that can elicit action potential firing. We also found that both layer 2 and layer 3 synapses with CA2 neurons showed a very large long-term potentiation, suggesting a role of these synapses in learning and memory formation. To address whether CA2 neurons can excite CA1 neurons to complete a disynaptic loop, we obtained recordings between pairs of CA2 and CA1 neurons. In contrast to a CA3 neuron, which normally makes at most a single synapse with a CA1 neuron, a CA2 neuron forms multiple synapses with a CA1 neuron. This allows a relatively small number of CA2 neurons to provide a strong input that can fire CA1 neurons. These results show that CA2 neurons lie at the nexus of a powerful disynaptic circuit linking convergent inputs from layer 2 and layer 3 neurons of the entorhinal cortex to the CA1 output of the hippocampus. We also found that there is a large feed-forward inhibition from CA3 to CA2, which may help to preserve the independence of the disynaptic and trisynaptic paths. This paper provides evidence for a parallel path of information flow that bypasses the trisynaptic pathway and is likely to play an important role in memory storage. One of the challenging goals in the future will be to try and perform experiments that enable us to test in more detail the role of CA2 neurons in memory storage, memory recall, and psychiatric disease.